My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now tonight, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, I've got a long title. Names of God, part one, primary names, part two. Jehovah. I thought we were going to do Jehovah and Adonai tonight until I was working on my notes, and I realized that that wasn't going to happen. So tonight, we're focusing on the name Jehovah. Now, getting to know God better can be done in a multitude of ways. The short of it is they all involve spending time with him or gaining knowledge about him. Now, it's fair to say that I am a good book learner and I'm a book person for sure. So intellectual information given in books and word studies works really well for me. It might not work as well for you. Nothing wrong with that. We're different. Nevertheless, taking the, the information, however much it might be, and chewing on it or meditating on the word is what it gets called, is a terrific way of getting to know God better. Last week, we opened this series by talking about the importance of God's names and the primary name Elohim, which identifies God as the creator, the strong one, the redeemer, the restorer, and the creator of our rest. As a brief reminder, Elohim is the only name given for God between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 2-3. But here's a fun question. Without thinking too, and you don't have to answer out loud, Without thinking too hard about it, what do you think God the Father looks like? There's a story that says one day a little boy was in school. He was drawing a picture. And his teacher came up and asked him, a young kid, probably second grade. And the teacher asked him, what are you drawing? No hesitation. The boy answered, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher said, you can't draw a picture of God because no one knows what he looks like. And the, boy, and the boy replied, well, they will when I'm done. Under the Old Covenant, God never allowed his people to draw or build an image of him. What we can grasp about God is what he reveals to us. Now, this reminds me of a conversation I had with a gentleman in Uber a while ago. It comes up that I'm a pastor when people ask what I do for work, and I have to give them all of the answers. But it comes up, and we were talking, and he told me, because I was doing my morning Bible reading still, that he tried to follow the Bible's teachings, but he said he wanted to do it without it being tied to Jesus because he felt that to do so would be too limiting of how great and how infinite we know God is. And I stopped for a minute so that I didn't say things you can't, not say, you can't take back. So I wanted to articulate myself well. And I told him, I'm sorry, the idea, I'm sorry, I told him that I understood what he's trying to say, but I don't think I could do what he was trying to do. The idea that God is too big or too grand for us to understand creates distance between him and us. Now, personally, myself, I don't like that. I don't like something that introduces a separation when Jesus came to end that separation. So, my rebuttal to that argument was very simple. If God wanted to remain too big, too grand, and too infinite, why does the Bible tell, tell us in Colossians that Jesus is the perfect visible image of the invisible God? That all the fullness of deity rests in him, as we'll see later. Now, trust me, we will not finish this series without talking about Jesus. He's probably going to come up every week. Huh? What? Yeah, he is. He is. Now, what I can tell you is that some of the ideas might seem too mystical or too esoteric, but know that they fit neatly within who Jesus is. God reveals his character, his specificity, and his identity through his names. We're going to start looking at the name of God with which most of us are familiar. It's the most frequently used name in the Old Testament, clocking 6,519 separate 
occurrences. Jehovah. Now, in, in case I hadn't said it yet, and I might have glossed over it last week, uh, we're getting sort of a field guide from the Tony Evans book called The Power of God's Names. That's, that is the general outline. Uh, there's a lot of good meat in that book. There's a few bones worth spitting out, but there's a lot of good meat there if you decide to read it. And one of the first times we see the name Jehovah is in Exodus 3, when Mo, or one of the first times it's revealed to us, and we get a deeper understanding of it, is in Exodus 3 when Moses approaches the burning bush. Now, as a point of interest, earlier in the chapter, we find out that Jesus is the one talking to Moses in the burning bush. Anytime you see the angel of the Lord with a capital A, that means Jesus showed up, but he just wasn't born yet, so they couldn't call him Jesus. You know, minor technicality. Now, when this meeting happens, Moses had been in Midian for 40 years. When Moses was 40 years old, he rejected the life of Egyptian royalty and murdered an Egyptian who was abusing a Hebrew slave. He was rejected by the Hebrews who saw his actions as the violent act of an angry man instead of the protective action of a brother. And the Egyptians saw him as someone who killed one of them and who had rejected them in favor of these slaves. So to avoid Pharaoh's wrath, Moses did the smart, pertinent thing, and he ran very far away. <laughs> he ran to a foreign land. He settled down, got married, and worked as a shepherd for his father-in-law, who was the priest of God in Midian. That was 40 years ago. Now, Moses is 80. And that's where Moses is and what he's doing when God meets him at the burning bush and tells him he is supposed to lead the nation of Israel out of captivity so that they can worship God and God can eventually lead them into the promised land. To be fair, Moses kind of balks a little bit at the idea. Moses can't see how God's going to use him for such a great purpose, and it ties into something we know about God. God never delivers an individual from a situation only for the sake of that individual. He always has a greater plan in mind. He is always going to use every plan he has perfectly. So that even though you feel like you are the direct beneficiary of it, it's going to ripple and it's going to have a positive effect and a godly effect on those around you who are also in the circumstance. He always has a greater plan and it usually goes towards advancing his kingdom and advancing his glory. Now, by the way, Exodus 8 1 is where we find the purpose of the people leaving Egypt is to worship God. And God doesn't deliver us so, he can forget, so we can forget him. He reveals himself so that we might worship and fully know him. In Exodus 3, verses 10 through 15, it says, Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, and then bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And God said, certainly, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve and worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, behold, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers or ancestors has sent me to you, and they say to me, well, what's his name? What do I say to them? Now, in fairness, that feels like a solid question from Moses. <laughs> I've been gone for 40 years. They didn't like me when I was there. And now you're telling me I get to come and tell them that we're leaving, where they've been for 430 years, 400 of which in slavery. Whose authority am I acting on? Whose name am I representing? Because they're going to ask, and I need to have an answer better than, I don't know, let me get back to you. So look at God's answer. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Then God also said to Moses, this is what you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob or Israel has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is is my memorial name to all generations. God reveals so much about himself in that statement. It's an important name 
for more than just how many times the name is used. God is telling Moses and the Jewish people exactly who he is. Now, my favorite translation of verse 14, because verse 14 is where God says, I am who I am, comes out of the Amplified Classic translations. And God said to Moses, I am who I am and what I am, and I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. I love that expansion and understanding of how immutable and unmovable God is. He is Jehovah. The name is so sacred in Jewish culture that Jewish people don't speak it for fear of accidentally taking the Lord's name in vain. The correct, the correct pronunciation of the name Jehovah in Hebrew has been lost to time because of that. Even when scribes, whose job is to write copies of the Torah, would not speak the name when they were copying it while they were doing their work. Now, according to Tony Evans' research in the book, the four consonants in this self-revealing name of God form what is known as the Tetragrammaton. In fact, the literal translation of the word Tetragrammaton is simply the four letters. They are the Hebrew letters Yud, He, Vav, and He. The combination of these consonants is derived from the word that means to be. Now, because all four letters are consonants, the vowels from the Hebrew word for Adonai were actually later added in order to help us pronounce the name. Initially, this rendering of God's name, YHWH, was Yahweh. And when it was translated into English, it became the name with, which most of us today know it as, Jehovah. So when you hear the name Jehovah, keep in mind, this is the Hebrew name Yahweh, which comes from the God-given name, Y-H-W-H, meaning I am the existing one. And on another note, when you come across Lord or God, written in all caps in the Bible, that's a translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah. A good example of that is if you'll flip back to Genesis 3.1. I don't know if I have it in my notes or not, but that's a good showing of it. And this is stuff I learned and I'm excited to pass on, so... <laughs> Uh, amplified, 3-1. Genesis 3-1, please. This is what happens in that verse. Remember, we talked last week about Satan and his deception of Eve in the garden, how Satan omitted part of God's name to suit his purposes. So here it is. Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, and skilled in deceit than the living creature of the field, which the Lord God has made. Now I don't know why they don't do it in the Amplified, but in almost every other translation, Lord is written in all caps. They just make the O, R, and D tiny. And the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God has said you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Satan omitted part of God's name to suit his purposes. The name he stripped from God in that conversation is Jehovah. Lord is regular, Lord written regularly is how God's other primary name gets translated, which we will discuss next week. That's the name Adonai. And if Elohim is God's creative and powerful name, Jehovah is God's personal name. Jehovah is how God answered Moses when Moses asked, what's your name? What do I call you? Who do I say? When we study Elohim, we're studying the creator, and we can talk about his power and his presence and his prowess. When we talk about Jehovah, we're talking about his person and his character. A person can believe in Elohim without actually knowing Jehovah. Now, the first thing to discover about Jehovah is that he is a person. He is the I am. He is a living and very personal God who has emotions, who has intellect, who has will. He is also a self-existing being. Now, you and I are not, so this might be hard to swallow, but just take it on faith. I'm going to try to describe it best as I can. He doesn't just exist, but he exists in himself. The way to understand that is that nothing outside of God contributed or contributes to his existence. God doesn't have a mom and a dad. You and I exist 
because our parents exist. You could say we are, in fact, a consequence of their actions. We need oxygen and food and water and to go to the bathroom in order to maintain our life. Our continuing existence comes as a result of those needs being met. God does not exist because of parents or the satisfaction of, continually, of continuing bodily requirements. He exists because he exists. He has no beginning. He has no end. He was not made. He is the one who makes. He simply is. Now, if that seems too big, that's where the wonderful thing of faith comes into being, where you just kind of take it on faith. You accept it, and you choose to believe in it, even if it doesn't make total sense to your natural mind. Again, Jehovah is the immutable God. Our experience may say that God changes in our lives, but what actually is more likely to change is our perspective of him. He is immovable. James 1 says that his shadow doesn't even shift. And if you think about God, this is where people go, well, God changes his mind. Well, from your perspective, probably. If you think about God in the book of Jonah, he starts the book by telling Jonah, Nineveh is on the path to destruction if they don't repent, and I'm sending you. They do repent after a little hiccup on Jonah's part. And God decides to be merciful and gracious and compassionate to the Ninevites. Now, did God change his mind about Nineveh? I don't think he did. I think God longs to be merciful and gracious and compassionate all of the time. But it took Nineveh's decision to turn to God to reveal that facet of his personality to them. Otherwise, they were going to go down like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, God wants to reveal more of himself to us all the time. Some people will say, you know, God waits until you're in the worst possible situation to show himself to you in a new and exciting way. No. 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 You see, the problem is that's where natural human logic fights against the way God actually is. God wants to reveal more of himself to us all the time. Now, it usually only happens after we become the victim of a country song because that's when we decide to focus solely on God and to pay attention and to give him the control that he's been asking for the entire time. God isn't waiting in the wings for your life to turn into a scatological delicacy before revealing a new part of himself to you. He's ready the whole time. Don't think that God wants to turn your life into a dumpster fire just so he can show off with a bigger turnaround at the end. Tests and trials and temptations are a part of life. Now, God, doesn't, God does bring tests according to the Bible, but he doesn't bring us trials or temptations. He also isn't doing it to be cruel or unkind. Tests show us where we are in our walk of faith. Now, God already knows, but sometimes we don't. We don't know where we're at until we're going through the fire. Trials and temptations can serve the same purpose, but rest assured, trials and temptations are not God's doing. The Bible says that God can't be tempted, so how could he tempt you? And personally, I think trials are simply the consequences of our foolishness in our lives. Tests come from God. I make my own trials. When I don't button my lip when I know I should and my wife is mad at me for a very good reason. That is a trial which I have brought upon me. God had no hand in that. God was probably, the Holy Spirit was probably in the back of my head being, dude, shut up. <laughs> and I just didn't have the sense to listen. Sometimes we fail to notice God even when he's trying to get our attention. When Moses heard the plan that God had for him, he reminded God that he, he couldn't speak well let alone speak to Pharaoh. And so Jehovah answered in Exodus 4, 11 through 12, the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and will teach you what to say. Now amazingly, even after that reassurance, Moses kind of doubles down and goes, dude, I really don't talk. Like, it is not my thing. God says, you think I'd, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> I, 
I really don't speak well. And God goes, you think I don't know that? Well, yeah, you know that, but I really don't want to do this. All right, fine, get Aaron. I'll have Aaron be my mouthpiece since you're not going to do it. The very succinct summary of Exodus 4. Now, Jehovah can exercise authority over his creation and direct and make commands because he is not only Elohim, the great and powerful creative creator, but he is also Jehovah, the Lord, the master, and the self-existent one. God identifies himself as Elohim, like we said earlier, from Genesis 1-1 to 2-3. And he introduces himself to us as Jehovah for the first time, starting in Genesis 2-4. And through the rest of chapter 2, that's how God is spoken of. That's how he tells us about himself, is through the name Jehovah. And as Jehovah, in Genesis 2, he interacted with mankind in his creation by forming man in verse 7. In verse 8, he planted a garden. In verse 9, he caused the garden to grow. In verse 15, he took the man and put him into the garden. In verse 16, he commanded the man. In verse 19, he formed every beast and brought them to the man. In verse 21, he caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Verse 21, he also took one of the man's ribs and closed up his flesh. And in verse 22, he fashioned into a woman the rib he had taken from the man. All of those things are personal things that God did as Jehovah. Jehovah is how he interacts with his creation. Jehovah is the most common name we see because that's the one where he goes, hi, over here. (laughs) I'm the one you're looking for. Even if you don't know it, I'm the one you're looking for. As we discussed last week, Satan's deception with Eve includes changing the way God is spoken of by omitting the name Jehovah which represents God's relational nature to them. Now, the deception started to work when Adam and Eve dropped the same name in the conversation. Retaining the name Elohim was fine because the great and powerful creator isn't personal in the same way Jehovah is. In Genesis 3, 1 through 3, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord God has made. And I don't know why the El... The Lord didn't capitalize right. Anyway, and the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God has said you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden except the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God, not Lord God, God said you shall not eat of it nor touch it, which was not in the original instructions, otherwise you will die. Now you could argue that religion pulls the same trick Satan did by omitting your relationship with Jehovah in favor of fearing and revering Elohim. Honestly, I would call that a trap that you don't want to fall into. Not a good way to go. How then can we get to know Jehovah? In the Old Testament, Moses serves a wonderful example in Exodus chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. Now Moses used to take his own tent And pitch it outside the camp, far away from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting of God with his own people. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the temporary tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand, each at his tent door, and look at Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the doorway of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses." When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tent door, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. And so the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his attendant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now later on in the chapter, Moses asks to see God's glory, even though they had been speaking face to face. Moses asked Jehovah to let him know his ways so that he could have a closer, more intimate, more deeply personal relationship and understanding of him. Moses went on to request that Jehovah's presence go with them as a way of showing all the others that the Israelites had found favor in God's sight. In verses 17 through 23, same chapter, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing you have asked, for you have found favor or loving kindness and mercy in my sight, and I have known you personally by name. Then Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, 
I will make all my righteousness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. For I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion and loving kindness on whom I will show compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place beside me, and you shall stand there on the rock. And while my glory is passing by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and protectively cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses' main desire, I know I just said this and I know I'm probably hammering the same points over and over, but they bear repeating. Moses' main desire was to get to know Jehovah better. He didn't want to settle for knowing about. He wanted to know personally. Moses was willing to be separated from the rest of the nation of Israel so he could get to know Jehovah better. He made the time and took the effort to get to know Jehovah as well as he possibly could. And don't we want the same thing? Then we need to do the same thing that Moses did. We do not need to follow the law. The law is dead and gone. Read 2 Corinthians 3. You know what Moses did? He asked and he sought. In Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, Jesus says, Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will, give, will instead give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will instead give him a snake? If you then, evil and sinful by nature as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven, perfect as he is, give what is good and advantageous to those who keep on asking him? Now, yes, Jesus is talking about being persistent in prayer. I also think he was talking about seeking God diligently, as the writer of Hebrews spoke of in Hebrews 11.6. And a great thing about what Jesus said in that passage is that the it in verses 7 and 8 can be anything that fits in with God's will and God's character. He won't honor a prayer to smite down and strike and destroy humans because that goes against his nature. But I bet I, every dollar I got and a whole lot that I don't that God will honor your prayer about knowing Jehovah better and more intimately. Back to Moses. Jehovah gave him a personal manifestation of his presence and glory when Moses was covered by God's hand and tucked away in the cleft of the rock and he saw God's back pass by. Exodus 34, verses 5 through 8. Then the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with Moses as he proclaimed the name of the Lord. By the way, they are on the top of Mount Sinai. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, the compassionate, and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth or faithfulness, keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands. He was talking about thousands of generations. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Visiting or avenging the iniquity of sin and guilt on the fa of the fathers upon the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. That is calling the children to account for the sins of their fathers. It is at this moment I am incredibly grateful that we are under the covenant of grace and not under the covenant of the law. Because that don't apply to us. We just get the good stuff. <laughs> Verse 8, and Moses bowed to the earth immediately and worshiped the Lord. I am so glad that Jehovah is personal and intimate in a different way than Elohim is. God wants to reveal things to us that we never have dreamed of. He wants us to experience his vision and his plan for us. But that requires a different experience of God than we get from simply knowing about Elohim. It comes from knowing Jehovah. Now maybe you don't know how to start that process. There's a very simple answer. You start with Jesus. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God in the fullness of deity. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him, talking about Jesus, 
All the fullness of deity, the Godhead, dwells in bodily form, completely expressing the divine essence of God. We mentioned earlier how Satan and religion tried to deny you the relational aspect of God, focusing on Elohim and omitting Jehovah. Jesus is the expression of both. Now, Jesus will continue to appear in this series, probably every week, for the same reason. Jesus completely expresses the divine essence of God. He is our ultimate expression of Jehovah. Now, there are so many other names in the Bible that include the word Jehovah. And we're going to go over some of those in a few weeks. But those are what get called secondary names, where it is one of God's name either combined with another one of his names or with a characteristic about him. You see, we've heard names like Jehovah Jireh, which is the Lord provides, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Nisi, my banner in war. Jehovah Rapha, which I believe is my healer. And if it's not those, if I've got them backward, I've got them backward. But Jehovah is the most popular name for God used in the Old Testament. And Jehovah, by far and away, has the most secondary names associated with it. And it includes everything from the God who is near and the God who is far away because he is absolutely everywhere all at the same time, even though our brains have a hard time processing that. (laughs) But as we go from here, and as we take this information and we chew on it, last week we got to sit and think and chew and meditate and stew, as I like to call it, on how God is Elohim, how whatever my problem is, he is the strong one. He doesn't need my help to fix the problem because he don't need my help for stuff like that. Honestly, what I feel like God needs me to do most of the time is get out the way and do what he tells me. <laughs> but as humans, we, we've been known to be slightly stubborn on occasion. And we take a little more coercion than that. We were able to focus last week on how he is the creator. How he is the restorer how he brought into order what was chaos and darkness. How he is our rest. Elohim is our rest because he created it and he made it for us. And that rest is complete for us in Jesus. But now, I want you to think about God, about Jehovah, like he's sitting across from you at the dinner table. Like he's riding shotgun when you're in the car. Now, maybe you got a kid in the front. I don't think God would mind sitting in the back seat of a minivan. Maybe that's just how I see him. I don't know. But thinking about him and knowing that his desire is to be so personal and so intimate that it doesn't jar you to think about him standing there in line holding your hand with his hand on your shoulder telling you, well, come on, it's over here, it's this way. No, why are you going that way? What are you doing? Not there, here. Or maybe that's just how he interacts with me. I don't know. (laughs) but the personal, relational God, the God who will wipe away your tears and dry your eyes and give you the hug that you need. It's the same God who made all of those things, who is our strength, who is our rest and our restorer and our redeemer. And this is just a different part of who he is. One does not negate the other. They work in tandem. If you'd be kind enough, I'm, I'm done. I've been waffling for a few minutes now. If you'd be kind enough to bow your head and close your eyes, I'm going to say a prayer. We'll speak a blessing. We'll be on our merry way. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for being who you are and loving us how you do. We give you all the praise and the honor and the glory because you are the only one to whom they are due. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to come, to live, to die, and to be raised from the dead on the third day, to pay the penalty for our sin. And we thank you, God, that as an act of our will, we can choose to accept him as our Savior and start a relationship with him so we can have victory in this life and a home in heaven for eternity when we leave here. God, I thank you that as we go from here, you will reveal yourself to us as Jehovah in a mighty way that you would give us a revelation of who you are in relation
relationship with us, not just, in the, not just as our creator and our strength. I thank you, God, that this hasn't just been hot air blown around by some lump of clay. This has been good seed scattered into good soil, that it will take root and bear fruit in our lives. That as we go from here, we're going to look more like Jesus in everything we say, everything we do, the way that we do it, and with the thoughts that we think. We give you all the praise and the honor and the glory, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I speak a blessing on everyone here in the six major areas of life, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Father, pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they'll say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. That's wonderful to hear. I love you terribly. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Have a fantastic week. God bless you. We'll see you next time.